Hi everyone, in this third lecture for week two, we are going to be discussing the magical trees in the Garden of Eden, which is found in Genesis 2 and 3, as well as the expulsion of the first humans um, from this garden, usually designated as the fall in Christianity. Um, as I'll explain, it's probably not the fall, but okay. Um, as we move on with this video and other subsequent videos, the stories will get more complicated. So just um, a warning or just, I guess, a piece of advice, uh, please read the assigned stories or the narratives in the Bible before you listen to the lectures, because I will be re referencing the story throughout. And so it's best to have it kind of fresh on your mind. Um, as with the other lecture videos, you can also choose to listen to this as an audio because I won't, I will not be showing any slides. Okay. We are told in the second J story of creation, remember we discussed the first P story of creation, okay. Um, we are told that in this J story, the second story, that in the middle of this garden that God plants and creates uh, called Eden, there are two very important trees called the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is found in Genesis 2.9. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is delightful for sight and good for eating. And the tree of life was in the middle or in the midst of the garden. And the translation here varies. And also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is my own translation. Um, these important trees um, are referenced again. And, and, and some commentators argue that um, in being referenced again, they are also highlighted or stressed by God when God tells the first human um, who later becomes Adam. Um, in the early parts of Genesis uh, 2 and 3, he is simply called Ha'adam, the person. Okay, so um, really he only gets the name when he gets kind of thrown out of the Garden of Eden, okay? So God stresses the trees or points out these important trees again with a warning that on the day that the uh, fruit of the wrong tree, that is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when that's consumed, that the, uh, the person will die. And this is found in Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man or the person, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay. Now you want to keep this warning in mind and also start to think about whether it's actually true as you think about how the story unfolds. Okay. When you move on to the next chapter, Genesis 3. Genesis 3 begins with the introduction of the serpent. And it's important to keep in mind, as in the other stories, you don't really have the kind of morality, moral system um, that comes later, okay? So the serpent here is just the serpent. He has not been tra uh, transformed into Satan or the devil yet. Actually, that takes a while, even when Satan is directly mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. He is not the Satan that you know of. Um, rather, it's, um, Hasatan, the Satan, seems to have been a job title, so many different angels could have this job title, okay? Um, and then Genesis 3, the, the snake here is simply the snake, okay, um, or the serpent, okay? So then, why is, and of course we all know how the story turns out, you know, why is the snake or a serpent chosen for this role? Okay? And there's lots of theories. Um, Coogan, in your textbook, argues that, um, the serpent, because of its shape and, and, other, and other reasons, um, is, 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 is a phallic symbol. And of course, as you read the story um, and the secondary articles that I assigned, this story about Eden is rightfully about sexuality. Okay, so maybe that's why the snake is chosen for this role. Um, snakes are, of course, mythologically very important um, objects or creatures. Um, they were sometimes divinized, and so, it, it, and so you do wonder if this is, uh, the serpent is chosen, the serpent here pictured as a kind of demigod, kind of a mischievous god, a, a kind of a trickster god that causes civilization, civilizations to either come into being or to advance or progress to a new stage. Maybe this is why the serpent is chosen. 
Um, as I talked about in previous videos, a serpent also is the animal symbol of chaos or the waters. You know, when I say the waters, I, you know, I should be more specific. The ocean waters, the ocean, which is uh, symbolized as chaos uh, or disorder, which in turn is represented by the serpent or a snake or a dragon, um, sometimes called the Leviathan or the Rahab because of the waves. Okay, um, you do wonder if the serpent is used here because of this representation or because of the symbolic resonance, um, because of course what the serpent does is that he himself um, itself represents a kind of introduction of chaos into this very neatly ordered garden. Okay, and of course, one of the questions you can ask is, well, how did he get here? Okay, which the text does not really answer. Um, snakes and serpents are also, like I said, symbolically very rich. There's lots of ideas that you can play with. Um, because of the fact that they shed their skins, they um, symbolize regeneration, uh, maybe to some degree eternal life. Okay. Um, and remember the story, like a lot of the stories in the primeval history, this probably being the first one, but also to some degree, maybe Genesis 1 as well, is about the separation between humanity and the gods. One of the main separation being that the fact that they don't live forever. Okay. So um, the snake might also, um, in that symbolism of, you know, in symbolizing regeneration or eternal life already is kind of foreshadowing what will happen in this tale. Okay. Um, I can go on forever about the snakes. Snakes also symbolize poison as well as healing. This is why you see this on um, snakes around the pool in the medical symbol. Um, and of course, there's this question about whether the fruit that is eaten, whether it's poisonous or is it something else? Is it the opposite of poison? Is it really what gives you true life? Right. And there's, you know, um, so there's these questions at work in this tale. Okay, so Genesis 3, for whichever one of the reasons you may want to choose, and you may think of new ones, um, begins with a serpent, okay? And the serpent is described in a very particular way, and here again, your translators are determining how you envision the serpent, and a, and a lot is lost in translation that way, okay? So Genesis 3, 1, okay, uh, begins this way. Now the serpent was more crafty, and this word in Hebrew is arum, okay, than any other wild animal that the Lord God has made, okay? But by translating as crafty, you already have the sense that there's something wrong with the serpent, that he's bad or evil as he comes to be kind of known, right? But this is, I think, to me, a kind of not quite right translation. It's not wrong, right? It's just a little bit too biased, right? And um, this word arum can be translated differently, Okay, it can mean prudent or super smart or insightful or maybe even, you know, street smart or intelligent. Okay, and, and this word is also not just used of the serpent, right? It's actually used of God and speaking about God's intelligence or understanding. Okay, um, so, you know, another reading of Genesis 3.1 is to say, well, now the serpent was more intelligent. Right, was, was a lot more insightful than any of the other wild creatures, okay? So it doesn't, the serpent can be read differently without having this kind of negative tense, okay? Now, as is well known, the serpent approaches the woman and he asks her about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil okay? So why does the serpent approach the woman instead of the man, okay? Um, now, it's traditionally assumed, and by tradition, I mean the long history of churchly exegesis, which has been done mostly by men, okay, and it's usually been assumed that the serpent approaches the woman instead of the man because of some assumed weakness on her part. She is more easily tempted, okay? And, and, and again, notice that that's an assumption that's not there in the tale. Someone's making that up to explain that. Okay. Well, you know, um, if that's the case, of course, there's other reasons why the serpent might have chosen to talk to the woman first, okay? Um, that's maybe more positive, right? Uh, one idea is, well, maybe he's being, you know, kind of empathetic. Notice that if you read the biblical text, no one talks to the woman, or at least not directly. They talk about her. Adam does that little praise song. Okay, but notice that God never talks to her and this man never talks to her directly, okay? So actually the first creature that talks to the woman is the serpent, 
Okay, so you do wonder, you know, one other reading is that the serpent comes to talk to the woman because maybe she seems lonely. Okay, or kind of going off that, maybe she seems more intelligent or more curious. Okay, um, is it bad that the serpent who is described or described as intelligent or insightful, right, approaches the creature that, uh, who may also seem more insightful uh, and more curious and more intelligent? Okay. Um, other reasons why it is the woman that the serpent approaches, um, of course, women are more traditionally associated with sexuality as they are the ones that give birth. And if the snake or the serpent is a phallic symbol, then this would make sense that the snake, okay, um, also closely associated with uh, sexuality would approach the woman. Okay. Um, it would also make sense that the snake approaches the woman if snakes are seen as um, related to kind of culture in some ways. Of course, women are seen as culturizing. I'll talk more about this in a moment. Okay. Um, so for whatever reason, okay, um, the snake uh, approaches the woman first. Okay. Um, and notice it doesn't have to be read negatively. Okay. Um, and um, he, the snake uh, approaches the woman and he begins with a question. Okay. Which is, Always, again, a very smart way to be uh, to kind of start up a conversation. And he says, you know, did God say you shall not eat of any or all the trees in the garden? And in so doing, what the serpent does is cleverly draws attention to the one tree that is forbidden, um, separating it out. Right now, as I kind of insinuated in the beginning, God Himself might separate out the tree two by planting it in the middle or midst of the garden. If you want someone to stay away from something, you really don't want to plant it straight in the middle and then point it out to them and then tell them they shouldn't eat of it, okay, or touch it or whatever, okay. Um, now, so, you know, there is a question if you do kind of, if you do a fresh reading with new eyes, whether the snake maybe is in cahoots with God. Or another way to put it is one of the questions we'll get to is, what does God exactly want to happen with these creatures in the garden? Okay, did he really not want them to eat of it? If he didn't, again, like, like I said, why did he plant it in the middle? Why not put a fence around it? Why make it tempting by making it forbidden? Also, why did he let a wily snake loose? Okay, um, so God's motivation is not um, no. Okay, um, another question we can ask is, you know, where is God when um, the snake starts talking to Eve? Shouldn't, I mean, there's not that many things in this garden, you know, shouldn't he be keeping um, a more uh, insightful eye on these creatures, okay? Um, it, and, 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 and these questions kind of lead to other questions about God. Like I said, God's motivations we can only infer or interpret these interpretations. We don't really know because the text never directly tells us, okay? And, and even though this character in Genesis 2 and 3 is called God, you do have to wonder how trustworthy is this character, okay? Especially since we are never told about what they're thinking, okay? Okay, um, so for whatever reason, God is, you know, uh, absent, and there's this tree, um, and the snake has approached Eve and has pointed out the tree, okay? And of course, to this clever question of the snake, um, the woman responds, okay, with this prohibition, okay? And notice what she adds, because she adds a pro, uh, she has, you know, she adds uh, something extra to this prohibition that's not there, at least uh, to the reader, okay? So this is found in Genesis 3.3. Um, and he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. Okay. Notice how she, in her description, goes beyond what the Lord says. Okay. And says that she's not, they're not even allowed to touch it. Okay, and, and here the question shifts. Why does she add this? Is she making, you know, has she added something to make the fruit even more tempting, more forbidden? Or is it just simply that she's misinformed? Okay, indeed, where did she get this idea? Or where does she get the news of the forbiddenness of this tree anyway? Um, like I said, we're never told that Adam tells her anything directly, but maybe, you know, maybe there's some un, you know, dictated conversation, okay? If so, did the man misinform her? 
did he add this clause to make it more tempting too, or because he felt really tempted, you know? Um, so has she been misinformed? Or does she know it through general garden gossip? You know, again, it's, it's very hard to know how information um, is present here, okay? Um, and, 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 and with this lack of knowledge, it's very hard to trust anybody's motivations, okay? Um, so in response to the woman's slightly misinformed statement, the serpent argues that, no, 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 that's not true. God has either lied or the serpent hints that God has not told the full truth, okay? Why? Because when the woman eats from the tree, she will not die. But instead of death, which is bad, something good will happen. Her eyes will be open. And it says, you, she, she will be like the gods. Okay, this is 3, 4, Genesis 3, 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God or the gods. And I think the plural is a better translation here. Okay, as I said, every time it says God in the Bible, it, it is in the plural. Okay, so when you eat of it, you shall be like the gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, um, now what's so interesting about what the serpent says is, and then again, showing you how intelligent he is, is that the serpent is not really lying. Okay, and again, the idea that the serpent lies comes from this later association of the serpent with the devil or Satan and, you know, the father of lies, that business. But like I said, that's not here yet. Okay, that really comes about in the first and second century. This is uh, probably older literature. Okay, we don't quite have that. Okay, and more importantly, the serpent does not necessarily lie. Okay, um, he doesn't tell the complete truth either. Actually, both God and, and the snake tell kind of half truths, okay, or half lies, depending on how you want to see this. Okay, um, it is true as the serpent says, that when they eat this fruit, that the humans will gain a special kind of knowledge that will make them like the gods, okay? And this, um, as we'll see, that's the problem, okay? And it is also true, as the snake says, that the humans will not, as God seems to hint, immediately die. And here is where God seems to fib a little bit, okay? Um, what the snake does not spell out you know, um, is how these events, how gaining knowledge and becoming like the gods, how that and death is connected. And it is connected, okay? Humans do not die, and certainly not immediately, as God insinuates, because they eat from the tree of the knowledge and the knowledge of good and evil. But because once they do, and their eyes are open, and they do become like the gods, once they eat of it, the humans are then kicked out, okay? Who are they kicked out? By God, right? And why does God do this? And I'll give you the verse later. Um, in order to prevent them from eating of the other special tree, the tree of life, okay? Um, that's why humans die, okay? Not because they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but because of divine fear of what happens when they eat from both trees. Okay, so notice how every, you notice how the serpent and God both tell, you know, are not completely truthful, not completely lying either. Okay, now um, this, uh, what happens in the aftermath of eating of the tree, um, hints that the tree of life um, likely would have given the eaters eternal life. Okay, um, and that that may be why uh, once they eat of one tree, they're forbidden from eating of the other tree. Okay, um, so in some ways, God tells the truth um, when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the humans do die eventually. Um, it's just that neither God nor the serpent quite spells out how the thing leads to death. Okay. Um, so uh, this, uh, the second part of this lecture is continued in the next video. So turn to the next video for more on the trees and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden.